session uh, here. We, uh, we have the pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Michael Pinedo, um, who is a um, professor of uh, operation management in the U New York University. Um, I'm not sure he really needs a, a formal introduction because you all know his work. You may all know all the books he worked on, especially the one on scheduling. Um, he also authored many uh, paper, working paper, um, technical paper, sorry, on uh, planning, scheduling, and uh, financial risks. Um, Professor Pinedo worked with many companies to, to uh, make uh, scheduling better. And um, he also uh, is an editor for several journals especially Journal of Scheduling. And so uh, we are pleased to hear him uh, this morning. So uh, please, Professor, we are very happy to uh, welcome you. And um, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here and to be able to talk to you. It's. Um, a very enjoyable conference. By the way, in comparison with American conferences, this conference has an extremely nice atmosphere, very good food. It's really, uh, you know, us Americans, we can learn something from the French. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here and talk to you. I'm going to talk to you about some scheduling. Some of you know that scheduling is sort of something that I'm a little bit interested in. And uh, I'm going to talk with you here about some scheduling heuristics in practice. And actually, it's current practice and current issues that we are trying to deal with in a couple of industries that are actually of some importance. And this work is actually in co collaboration with two teams of researchers in South Korea. And they were postdocs of mine and the PhD students of my postdocs, and they are now back at two universities in South Korea. And you probably know the universities. One of them is Postec, and the other one is KAIST, the two institutes of technologies, the two top institutes of technologies in South Korea. Uh, it's, by the way, it's a pleasure to work with the South Koreans. They are extremely humble, and they are extremely hardworking. They should, it would be nice if in the United States we would adopt their work ethic. We unfortunately don't have it. Um, the talk is, consists of two parts, and it goes with regard to two industries. One is uh, in steel making, and you know steel making is important. Many of you have a car, and by the way, most of your car is made of steel. S some parts are also made of plastic. By the way, both steel and the plastic, to make it, causes a lot of pollution. So we actually have to be careful making it. And the other industry is uh, semiconductors. And semiconductors, you know, is also fairly important. Most of you have a computer, and are in, in that computer there are microprocessors, and there are DRAMs, and it's important that that computer works. And in both industries, South Korea plays a major role. By the way, this talk I cannot give in New York. It's absolutely forbidden to give this type of talk in New York because people in New York would not know what continuous cast steel making is. And they, I have to give talks in New York, it has to be on the risk management and financial services. So it's actually a pleasure to be able to give this type of a talk and the audience hopefully is a little bit interested in it. Okay, I'm going to talk about um, practice, but also theoretical models, and how close to our theoretical models come to what we really need in practice, and how far are we getting along. And we are going to, all, many of you know what a flow shop is. A flow shop, it's a bunch of machines in series. By the way, the queuing theorists among you will call it a tandem queue. And uh, flow shops have been, there are there is already books specifically on flow shops. And uh, we are going to talk about some generalizations of flow shops that are very important for industries. 
One of the generalization is flexible flow shops, and we are going to talk a little bit about that. Some other terminology that has been used for those type of flow shops is called hybrid flow shops. And we are going to talk about flow shops with re-entry. And you're going to see in which industries these two types of flow shops are very important. Um, the first talk will be about the flexible flow shops or the hybrid flow shops, and they are important in steel making. And we're going to talk about continuous cast steel making. I'm pretty sure that in this audience, there are many people that know what steel making is and know what continuous cast is. When you give this talk in New York, the percentage of people that know what I'm talking about is approximately 0%. Okay, I'm going to first give, uh, uh, and this is with a team. So the guy was a postdoc, his name was Kan Bok Lee. And they are in Pohang, uh, Postec. So Pohang is the city, Postec is the Institute of Technology, and the big steel maker there is POSCO, which is the fourth biggest steel maker, fourth biggest steel maker in the world. Uh, by the way, very well managed, like uh, a lot of companies in Korea. We are going to talk first about giving you a problem description. We are going to give you a solution method and experimental results and some conclusions. By the way, the way we work with a company goes as follows. Unfortunately, we cannot sell our solution to the company. We work with the guys there and we discuss the problem with them and we come up with ideas. Because those guys at POSCO, by the way, they are also pretty bright, they are very bright. Uh, they don't give us that much their ideas, but they want to know our way of thinking. And our way of thinking, we can publish it. Uh, but they are very careful not giving us their ideas. So what we suspect is that what they internally develop is a mixture of our ideas and their ideas. So probably it's better than what we publish but they for sure will make sure that what they are doing is not being published. That's the way certain companies work. And by the way, if I were in their place, I probably would operate like that also. So let me tell you a little bit, first, how the steel making industry, uh, what is the importance of steel making? Well, you probably know that it's fairly important because uh, you have, all of you have a car, or many of you have a car, and it's of steel. And uh, by the way, you may have plastic cars. By the way, they cause as much pollution uh, to make the plastic as the steel would make. So from an environmental point of view, plastic is just as bad as steel. And uh, so it's very important. And we know that those cities, for example, in mainland China, the Three biggest steel companies in the world are all based in mainland China. One of them is called Bao, Bao Steel. They are in a town, many of you know it, it's somewhere in the northeast of China, it's Shenyang. And by the way, the pollution there is terrible. And the Chinese also know it, so they are starting to work on pollution. It's really a major problem, the pollution. So they're, in China, they are planning to toughen emission checks on steel mills, and that has gotten a lot of visibility. So people are working on that. Now, the thing is, when we expand the conventional facilities in Europe, in Europe, or in the Far East, or in the United States, the United States has one small company, it's called Nucor, it's a continuous cast company, but Bethlehem Steel and US Steel don't exist anymore. Uh, here you can see sort of the image that steel making has. It's sort of this type of image doesn't make many people very happy. Uh, so it's something that you would like to avoid in the future. And it's based on the current way of making steel. It's called blast furnace operations. And uh, we are going to talk a little bit about you, you go from molten iron to molten steel, and then it goes into continuous cast, and then it's rolling, etc., etc. And it causes, by the way, a lot of pollution. And any expansion will be co costing also more uh, pollution. The steel-making people are working on new technologies. 
And that's a new technology. So it's called hydrogen-based steel making. And that will have less pollution. But that will be online maybe in 30 years. So in the coming 30 years, we are going to work with the old technologies. And we try to minimize, minimize the pollution. By the way, the only way, way to minimize pollution is good scheduling. Okay, So scheduling is actually important, believe it or not. I try to tell that to my department chairman. And he's nodding very politely that he agrees with me. But it's sort of a little bit like talking to my wife. <laughs> they, they nod very politely that she agrees with me. And then they do whatever they want to do. <laughs> Maybe some of you know. OK, so but with a perfectly biased opinion, uh, if you want to minimize pollution, better take a scheduling course. OK, and if you take a scheduling course, I can recommend you a good book. <laughs> OK, OK, so this is a, a steelmaker's commercialization plan by 2050. So the efficient operations of existing facility are still crucial. How does it look like? the existing facilities. Just for some of you may not, re very few of you may not be a complete expert in steel making. But here you see sort of what the steel making process is. First of all, you have iron ore that goes in. So there is iron ore making. Then it goes into steel making there. It goes into continuous casting. And then it goes into rolling. And when you go into rolling, the final product is these rolls of steel that goes to the car companies and other types of manufacturing facilities. OK? And steel making continuous, the continuous, the steel making continuous casting process is the bottleneck. So steps two and three here are the bottleneck of the process. And you want to maximize your production, of course. You want to maximize the utilization of that bottleneck. OK. What is the st steel making continuous casting process? Well, you have a charge that is a pot of molten steel. That is a pot of molten steel there. And that pot of molten steel has to go through a number of refining stages. What happens in the refining stages? In that steel, you have to put other metals in there, nickel, magnesium, whatever, dependent upon the client, what the client wants the steel to be, the exact specific type of steel. And each client will have its own, its own demands. And then. We have, and so this is now a flow shop, and some of you still know about the flow shop. You don't have to make photos of this. I'll give you the, I'll give you the PowerPoint afterwards. You're really interested in this? Oh, some people, at least when the person is making photos, that's at least a compliment. Then it's, he thinks it's not a complete waste of his time. But OK, but you can get the PowerPoint. Don't, don't worry about that. You can even pay attention now. Uh, it's uh, OK. So here you see sort of what happens. You have the charge of a pot of molten steel. And that before, the last step is actually the continuous casting machine. That's a continuous casting machine. But from that pot of molten steel, when it goes into continuous casting, we may have to put all kinds of little materials in there, dependent upon the, client, the particular client or the particular product, if it's a car company or some other type of company. It's a company that makes tanks for the defense industry. OK, and then you see sort of that some, there is sort of, they can, a particular type of a pot may actually skip certain refining stages. So you have here a number of refining stages. And they may have to visit a couple of the refining stages, but not necessarily all of them. Not, but everybody has there, has to go to continuous casting. <laughs> continuous casting, everybody has to go there. And uh, what is the, the semi the, what the, the semi finished products that come out of the continuous casting? Usually we have three types of semi finished products, and we call them the slab. You see how the size of a slab looks like a bloom or a billet. Those are the types of products that come out of. And after that, after the continuous casting, it goes to rolling mills, rolling mills, and then in the rolling mills they actually make that thin steel that goes to the goes to the client. OK, so here you see sort of the, there is the iron making that goes from the, uh, the iron making that goes here, the high ovens there, uh, uh, altos hornos, or they, they call it hoog ovens, or whatever type of name they have there. It goes into the steel making, and then at certain re refining, uh, sorry, 
certain refining stages, certain refining stages it has to go to, and then it goes here into the continuous casting, and after the continuous casting it has to go to the rolling mills. And the rolling mills, there it's where they make the thin steel that goes to the car companies. Okay. How does that have to be scaled? Well, let me tell you about the scheduling process. So you can see sort of the complexity of the scheduling process here. So it's really, uh, if you by chance teach a scheduling course, you may want to give this scheduling problem to some of your students. And then you see it is an important scheduling problem. And the reason is why it has to be, nowadays an objective, minimize pollution, is a very popular objective. So now, uh, now we can really make the case that it's an important problem. Uh, you see here, let me tell you a little bit about the casts. So we have here what we call casts. We have here casts. And the casts, you see them, the casts here, when they go to the continuous casting machine, you see here we have three casts in the continuous casting machine. And the three casts in the continuous casting, casting machine, it consists, it has a number of charges. A particular cast has a number of charges, and those are different products that have to go to different clients. By the way, the casts, so that's a composition of different charges, we cannot split them up, we cannot break them up. And we cannot change the sequence between, uh, within the cast. So when you see here the cast here at the bottom, the cast 3, 4, the cast 3, 4, they have to always stay together, and also in the sequence 3, 4. We cannot change the sequence from 3, 4 to 4, 3. So, but we can change different casts, different casts, we can change the sequence of the casts. So the one, two cast, we may be able to put it behind the three, four cast. That sequence we are allowed to change. And by the way, of course, there are sequence dependent setup times that we would like to minimize. And we have different continuous casting machines, parallel continuous casting machines, and we can put different casts on different machines. So you see here already, if you look at the particular charge here, the particular charge, look at charge, this is what we call a charge, the charge three here that goes to a particular client. It will be joined in a particular cast at the continuous casting machine, but that charge has to go to a number of refining stages, not all of them, some of them. And the one that will join them in a cast at the end, that charge four, that may go to different refining stages, or maybe none at all. This charge four there doesn't go to any refining stage. And it will be joined in the, continue, in the cast three, four. And we can scale the charges, or charge three, we can schedule it in time, and at the different machines, the different uh, processes, on the di in the different refining stages. And then we say, hey, listen, how are we going to do? So you see here a little bit about the constraints in which we work in. Uh, so you have here the molten steel, the composition adjustments, and the charges are in cast are continuously casted, and that's it. So we have your stages, machines, we have transportation time, we know all this, that's all the data that's given. We know of a charge, remember that single three or the single four, work, we call them charges. They have the require, each one has the required refining stages, and we have their processing times on each machine, and we have the due date at the last stage. The due date may be dependent upon the client. And the cast is a sequence of charges at the last stage, processed one after another in a given sequence within the cast. And there is a setup time at the last stage. Before a cast goes on a continuous casting machine, we may have a setup time which is sequence dependent with the previous cast that was on that machine. And what are the variables now, that the decision variables? We have a machine assignment of each charge at each stage, where are we going to put them, and the completion time of each charge at each stage. Those are our decision variables and auxiliary variables. So just to give you a sort of a feeling, what, let's have a simple uh, GAN chart here. So here you see charge 3. It has to go to refining stage 1 and refining stage 3, and then it will be joined later on in a particular continuous cast, and then it will be on that continuous casting machine. Okay, and so the cast, here we have the cast, that's 3, 4, and that cast 3, 4 may need a required setup time. Okay, so here you could see a composition of a scale. So here you see a particular scale. So we have three casts here, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6. We have six charges, and here we see how they're all 
scaled in the various stages. So just to give you, a, we know sort of the parameters and the variables of the problem, and let's talk a little bit about the objective function, because I told you already the objective function, and you can already imagine what the objective function is going to be. So this is really multi-objectives. And by the way, just to formulate that in an integer program, that's not a picnic. That's not a picnic. Uh, first of all, cast breaks. Boy, you have to avoid cast breaks. That's a, so that when we had the three, four in a particular cast, don't force the schedule to break those two charges. They, you would like to keep them in that one cast. We want to minimize the total waiting time between the stages. So what is the total waiting time between the stages? You can imagine already why that's important. Because if you have to wait too long, the material will cool off, and then you have to re reheat it again, and that costs electricity. And by the way, just with electricity, wherever that electricity comes from, well, if it's hydro or here in France, it's nuclear, OK. Uh, but in other countries, it may be from coal-fired coal-fired stations, and that causes a fair amount of pollution. Uh, you can imagine already that the waiting time between the stages, because you don't want to reheat charges, you don't want to reheat, that total waiting time between stages is an important part of the objective function. And then you have a due date at the end, and you want to hit that due date as closely as possible. So you want to minimize total earliness, and you want to minimize total tardiness. So you have the earliness of when a charge within a cast is completed, and the total tardinesses of all charges when they finish with the continuous casting. So by the way, I, we didn't write up the objective function in the integer program here, but you can imagine an objective function that when you formulate it of this integer program, it's not an easy objective function. It's not something that you give in your integer programming course for students to work on. It's really actually a complicated objective function. And um, here there are a number of constraints. By the way, there are many constraints based on all the machines. One, uh, one important one, we spoke already a little bit about that, that maximum waiting time between stages. And that is a very tough constraint. You don't want to charge in between two stages of the process to have to wait too long, because that will cost you a lot of money and reheating and all that type of stuff. OK. Let's talk a little bit about the literature in this problem. Just, uh, just to tell you a little bit about which are the industries in the world that causes the most pollution or that really demand the most electric electricity. Steel making is either number one or number two. And another one is, you know, those data warehouses, those server farms. By the way, they take also a whole bunch of electricity, but the steel making is up there. The amount of pollution it, ca it, it causes is very, very high. And the fact, actually, that the number one steel making country in the world right now is mainland China. The fact that in mainland China the pollution is worst of all places in the world is mainly because of steel making. OK, there has been a lot of work done on heuristic procedures. Because you can imagine already, we are going to talk a little bit about this later on. Of course, you can formulate this as a mathematical program, a nice integer program. And I can tell you already what the limitation is of integer programming. Uh, basically, this type of problem, it's impossible to solve. It's impossible to solve because the size of the problem, if you give your very fastest computer 20 minutes, the solution you end up with is a bad solution. It's a bad solution. So you cannot, you cannot really. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit about how often you have to solve this problem in a steel making facility. You have to solve this problem in a steel making facility maybe between four or six times a day. And when you put the data into your computer four or six times a day, you want the answer back in 20 minutes. You don't have more time than that. That's the amount of time. So this problem, just the practical uh, constraint you're working with, you have to solve it 
up to a half a dozen times a day, and the computer time that you allow it to take, maximum 20 minutes. Then you need a solution back, because you cannot wait longer. Integer programming will not work. After 20 minutes, you get really a lousy solution. Very bad, so we cannot. So people have, uh, by the way, the number of papers written about this subject is already maybe 50. Still making continuous casting. I'm not talking about hybrid flow shops. Hybrid flow shops in general, there are already 500 or 1,000 papers written. People have applied heuristic procedures. One of them is genetic algorithm. By the way, there is one school of genetic algorithm. It's, and those people have the most experience in genetic algorithm. It's basically a group of people at IIT Karagpur. So that's in Calcutta. And I think they have made their mission, and probably they have succeeded in that, of have, being the best genetic algorithm developers in the world. And they have written books on genetic algorithms, and they are really very, very, and very, so there are some papers written on that. There is a very, very nice paper written by a mixture of a Span Spaniard and a German, uh, Senor Ruiz from Valencia and Mr. Stutzel, and he introduced something called iterated greedy heuristics. By the way, that framework for heuristics is actually very effective. It has turned out to be very effective. By the way, there are some people that live by constraint-guided heuristic search. You know, there are people that are basically married to constraint programming, and they're very nice people. Some of my best friends are constraint programmers. But they have the habit of thinking that mathematical programmers are idiots. By the way, the feeling is usually mutual. But OK, the, <laughs> why? have you noticed you speak with a constraint programmer? But that's always start a conversation with a constraint programmer. Tell them how great mathematical programming is, is doing. It, it's an interesting way of starting a conversation. And also, opposite way. If you have a mathematical programmer, tell them, boy, constraint programming goes all so quickly. Uh, they, they seem to, they, there is a slight allergy. But okay, uh, that's, but there are people that do constraint guided heuristic search. And now there are people, maybe in the last 15 years, that are uh, using math heuristics. And what are math heuristics? Math heuristic has a heuristic framework. And within that heuristic framework, they solve integer programs. But because they have a, so you have a problem, you can, formulate that as an integer program, then it will have 10,000 variables or whatever. You cannot solve that problem because it's too large. So you have put it in a heuristic framework, and in each step of the heuristic framework, you have mathematical programs, but they are much smaller. And those you can solve maybe. You're not sure even those you cannot maybe, maybe you cannot solve. But within 10 minutes, you get a reasonable solution. That goes into your heuristic framework. and. Uh, Maybe now on that Pareto frontier of the amount of computer time you have and the quality of the solution, maybe you're really getting your being there at the frontier. So math heuristics is something relatively new. That's maybe 15 years. And there is recently there is a survey paper that appeared on that, Boschetti and Magnetzo. And we're going, by the way, this is literature on steel making continuous casting. So I talk now only about steel making conti continuous casting, just steel making. And you see here already a bunch of papers. By the way, each one of them has a particular heuristic they use. And they have a particular, just a single objective. Each one of these papers don't look at the real world problem. Because the real world problem, you really talk about multiple objectives. But there is a whole literature there, and there are people that really know something about steel making continuous casting. So you can look at this literature. It's actually quite a. So let's, what is our contribution actually to this, uh, to this literature? We combine the iterated greedy heuristic of Ruiz and Stutzel with the math heuristic. We use in the subproblems we solve mathematical programs. And how do we end up on that Pareto frontier of efficient solutions in the amount of time we have? And I told you already sort of 
how much is the amount of time we have. So here we have our objectives and we have the, our contribution to the literature is basically uh, we have an efficient method that's useful in practice. By the way, I, we cannot say that we know that it's being used at POSCO because they won't tell us. But they pay so much attention to what we are doing and they're spending so much time with us that we cannot imagine that they are spending so much time and not using the ideas. But they are not going to, so we cannot say that our solutions are really, we cannot officially say that because we really don't know. But I'm 99% sure that we have a big impact on their scaling. Okay, just to tell you a little bit about the iterated greedy uh, math heuristic. So iterated greedy, Many of you know already about that heuristic of Ruiz and Stutzel. And that combined with mixed integer programs and the subproblems, you see here you have an initial step, initial heuristic, and then they have a step here in the iterated greedy that they called destruction and construction. I th this is the terminology of Ruiz and Stutzel. By the way, I don't like their terminology that much because I think they probably should use destruction and reconstruction. And that basically what they do in the destruction and construction step, they, you have a schedule, you work, have a working schedule, you're destroying part of the schedule. Part of the schedule you destroy. You destroy part of the schedule, and now you're going to reschedule that part of the schedule that you destroy. And in that rescheduling part, for our particular problem, we use a mathematical program. And then we continue like that. By the way, how we go from how the sequence in which we change, we, how we, uh, uh, the sequence in which we choose the parts of the schedules that we destroy and reconstruct, how do we do that is as follows. Well, first of all, let me see here how the initial heuristic work. The initial heuristic, suppose here you have, again, three casts. You have three casts, and in each cast here you have three charges. And you see here already the three charges. You know now of the three charges, this is, uh, this is uh, the initial schedule may come up with this, the three charges on those two continuous casting machines. In this way here, and you know each one of the charges, how they go to the different refining stages. So the initial heuristic will come up with some scale. By the way, even in the initial heuristic, you may already solve some integer programs as subproblems. So um, that uh, step, while we destroy parts of the scale and reconstruct it, how do we do that? Suppose that we say, hey, listen, we have what we call a decast step here. That we say, hey, listen, we go to the continuous casting machine. And in that continuous casting machine, we are saying, hey, listen, I know what my current schedule has, a sequence of casts on those machines, and I'm going to move the, that sequence of casts around. And you see here, well, you see here this 4, 5, 6 here, this 4, 5, 6. Let's move it around and let's see what happens with the schedule and how are we going to how are we going to repair that schedule after we have the, made that move of the casts? So let's put that four, five, six, we put it on the other machines and actually at the beginning. By the way, all the charges that go into that cast now, you see the charges that go into that cast now, they all have to be rescheduled in the refining stages. Of course, they have to be rescheduled in the refining stages. And what do we do now? Now we say, hey, listen, those charges in the refining stages, let's optimize and see how we can improve on that new schedule. And we take a time window there, and we call that time window D, and we say, hey, listen, that time window D there, we are going to look at all the charges that complete, that have in the current schedule a completion within that time window, and those charges that have a completion in that time window, I'm going to they are candidates for rescheduling. And I'm going to solve an integer program that has the best schedules 
for all those charges there in that time window. By the way, you see here already that the time window is a different, different time window for the different stages of the process. And that you have to do that because otherwise, because the charges move in time, so that time window D, you see the time window D, for the earlier, for the earlier stages, it's a little bit earlier time window than for the later stages. Okay, so now you say, hey, listen, those charges that you see here, we are going to reschedule them. We are going to reschedule them, and we do that with the integer program. That's where the math heuristic comes in. That's where the math heuristic comes in, and we reschedule that. We get a new schedule. And by the way, then we look at the time window. Then the time window moves. We see the time window moves, and we have now different charges there that we want to reschedule again in that new time window. And we let the time window move through time till the make span, actually till the make span. And for each position of the time window, we solve an integer program. OK, so you see a little bit. It becomes already a fairly complicated heuristic. Just to tell you, is this worthwhile? By the way, and you know now sort of if it's worthwhile, you know the practical limitations that we work with. We have to get a good solution within 20 minutes on a very fast computer, basically the best computer you can buy. But 20 minutes. At 20 minutes, there is, that's a very, very tight limit. Just to tell you a little bit, uh, we test this now. We test this now on a whole bunch of testing problems. And the steel making people look at our testing problems. Why, this is, gives a sign of confidence when a whole group of people there leaves. Well, I don't, uh, don't know. I'm not offended. <laughs> 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 okay, just to tell you a little bit, we looked at the number of problem sizes. Uh, when you have small problem sizes, when you're talking about two, three casts, and maybe six to 12 charges, uh, that's a small. A practical one, you have four, seven casts. And you're talking about 30 to 36 charges. By the way, that's already an integer program you cannot handle. You cannot handle that for the original problem. And uh, this is the size of the processing times. The size of the processing times is 45 uh, to 55 minutes. Uh, for the continuous, 35, 45 minutes. For the refining stages, 30 to 40 minutes. By the way, there is transportation time. That's also part of the integer program. That can be 10, 10 minutes between all machines. You know the maximum waiting time. That's a very, very tight constraint. Between subsequent machines, you're talking about 30 minutes. OK? By the way, just to tell you, we are going to check, we are going to compare a number of heuristics. The first one is ours, the iterated greedy math heuristic. So that's the iterated greedy idea of Ruiz and Stutzel. And we combine that with mathematical programming. That's our contribution. And we say, hey, listen, if you have solved the problem originally by just solving the integer program and not use any iterated greedy heuristic, we call that just a MIP solution. Then you see here this, I told you already, uh, some of the most active and most prolific genetic algorithm users are those guys in IIT Delhi or Karakpur that really, uh, by the way, they have written a couple of books. And you should look at those books if you are interested in the genetic algorithms. And uh, th these are, uh, this particular genetic algorithm they came up with is actually very, very popular among steel makers. It's by uh, these guys, De Pratap Agarwal and Yarivan. Uh, it appeared in that paper there, in that journal, IEEE on uh, evolutionary computation. And we looked also at a simple genetic algorithm. Just to tell you a little bit about how do they, how do the, the, all the different methods compare? And here we see here on the y-axis the optimality gap. You see here the optimality gap. And you see here on the x-axis the size of the problem, small, medium, and practical. And here we have the different, the different uh, uh, solution techniques. By the way, how do we get the 0% optimality gap? 
actually we did solve the original problem with integer programming and we let the computer work for two days. And after you give an integer program, you give a computer two days, it comes up with a reasonable solution. And you stop it then, by the way, it has not, you, you are not, but at least you have some feeling of where the optimal solution lies. Okay, here you can see here, by the way, if you use that original, just to tell you, that original integer programming approach, but you put a 20 minute time limit on it, look at the optimality gap here. The optimality gap is 25%. So you can say, hey, listen, it's absolutely impossible to solve this just by making an integer programming formulation of the original problem. Because the solution that you're going to get will be lousy. You cannot, you cannot afford to have the solution. By the way, the best one that, you, that we had up to now is that up to when we came up with our iterated greedy math heuristic, the best one we had up to now was that genetic algorithm by the, you know, by the guys from IIT Karakpur, that, it, that particular algorithm is called NSGA2, that has an optimality gap of 9.29%. By the way, that's only estimated optimality gaps because I told you already we don't know for sure where the optimum lies. Okay, but we have sort of fairly clear idea. Well, we can, with our solution, we can cut that optimality gap by half. And by the way, cutting that optimality gap by half, going from 9% to 5%, that's actually, well, most of you that work in optimization, optimization in practice, that's a step that the people in practice really appreciate. They think they are not wasting their time listening to you. Okay, so this is sort of what, what we came up with. Uh, here you can see sort of, well, here you see the red line the red lines are the lower bounds, the lower bounds of the solution. Here you see the blue line here. That's our, the way our, the, how our converge. And here, up here, you see all our competitors. So apparently we are not doing that badly. And the interest that the steel, ma that the steel makers were, so even though they will not say if they are using our ideas, uh, they show interest. Okay, um, let me tell you a little bit. So there is a conclusion. So by, by the way, if by chance uh, you are, uh, if by chance you are interested in this talk after after hearing me, uh, we have published this, and probably you know about this journal here, uh, International Journal of Production Research. Okay, it has been published. Fortunately, Alexander. Okay, uh, let me tell you, the people in practice are reading this. I don't know if the academicians, academics, are reading it. But, okay, this is where our solution was published. Um, there are still many open problems here that people in practice would like to know. The problem is important because we had, you saw that optimality gap of still 5%. And the amount of electricity you're saving and in steel making, that's huge amounts of money. Uh, it's really very important. Okay, let's see, how many minutes do I have actually? What? Yeah, one. <laughs> one minute? Yeah, in fact, we are already late. But, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> well, listen, if by chance you are interested in, uh, okay. <laughs> Boy, if I have to tell the guy, my, this is my postdoc, Tayson Yu. He is, <laughs> uh, he has close connections with Samsung. By the way, among semiconductor manufacturer makers, you know that DRAMs, of course, Samsung is number one in the world. Uh, by the way, also uh, interesting people. Interesting, if ever you have the connection, they, they are willing to listen to your ideas. Um, this is on flow shops with re-entry, because in the steel making, you don't have re-entry. But in semiconductors, there is re-entry. That's a completely different way of looking at problems. Uh, if by chance you are interested in this, uh, that's an open field and the, and the semiconductor makers are interested in whatever you can come up with because there also a lot of money can be saved. Uh, if by chance you are still interested in this, I give my PowerPoint to Alexander and he can, uh, uh, and maybe actually you want to read our papers if you really have nothing better to do. But it's, uh, uh, <laughs> it's uh, but Alexander, 
So now, if uh, Odile doesn't want to give me, uh, as you know, our lives are controlled by women. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> my wife is very worried that I actually come back in the plane that I'm supposed to come back with on Sunday. <laughs> okay, what, uh, we have to answer questions? Are you, what? Uh, Thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> Thank you.